Hello, my garden friends. This is Jersey Shore Lisa from MyNJGarden.com, and it's time for the 2021 end of June garden tour. It's the side yard. Now, I've done a couple of videos back here in the side yard this summer to show you specific garden beds or specific plants, but I wanted to give you a quick overview of what I have happening over here on this side of the yard. Just go through the whole thing. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask you to please subscribe to the channel. MyNJGarden.com has frequent updates and I'd love to have you come along with me. So let's get started. This is a little bed that I built from scrap wood at the end of last year. Um, it has beets in it and a couple of fava beans. I just tucked in one of the last tomato starts that I had going in the greenhouse, but the greenhouse is getting so hot now um, during the day that none of the little plants can really survive in their little tiny starter cells. So I had to get them out. Um, and there's some strawberry spinach. The berries are just starting to turn red. That's just coming up everywhere because I had put that into the compost and um, it's just coming up all over the place. The seeds are so tiny. I don't even know how I would save seeds from strawberry spinach, but it's a welcome volunteer because it's a tasty green and it reliably comes up now kind of everywhere. It's self-seeded through the compost. And though the berries aren't delicious, the greens are. So uh, that's a welcome volunteer in my garden. I also have a couple of little starts of tobacco, which I got from Roughwood Seeds. Um, and it's a, it's an heirloom variety. It's, I, I believe it's a Native American heirloom variety. And um, so this is the first time I'm growing tobacco. Uh, this is some spiderwort that's over here. And there was one other plant next to this. This is a very shady area. So those spiderwort will survive in both full sun and shade. It's not the bushiest of all of my spiderwort plants because it doesn't get much sun, but it still blooms. It's a toughy. Um, there was another plant next to there, but I have some voles and the voles just took it right down. So um, we'll see if these guys survive. If they don't, they don't. I have it everywhere. <laughs> um, and let's see, there's May apples, which are a native shade loving ground cover. Uh, there's actually fruit down there on that May apple, but it hasn't changed size or shape. There's another one. Um, that's the first fruit I'm getting off of these May apples this year. And, um, it's really, it's stayed the same size for weeks and weeks now. So I have no idea when that decides to get bigger and ripen or if it even will. Uh, over in that bed, it's also a ve very shady bed. Uh, this is a hazelnut, an American hazelnut. So that's native. Um, there's another smaller one beside it. And these two are planted so close together because hazelnuts are wind pollinated. In the winter, they send out little catkins those catkins open up, the tiny little pink flowers bloom all along the branches and the wind will blow. They need to blow the pollen from the catkins from one dis genetically distinct variety to the next in order to pollinate those nuts and get your hazelnuts. Um, there are ramps planted under here. These are ostrich plume ferns and there's some smaller ones planted back behind uh, just in the beginning of this year. So these, these bigger ones are a little older and there's smaller ones back behind there. Over here, this is my cold frame and it has some butterfly weed and a big fuzzy butt bee in there is having a good time on that butterfly weed. Um, there are some radishes flowering in there and giving me these seed pods that I've been munching on as I go through the garden, but I'm also going to save the seed from those um, as they dry out. These are chestnut trees. I took some chestnuts uh, from around the holidays last year, and I just popped them into the garden on my way out to the compost bin with a bunch of other things I was going to throw in the compost, and they're growing. So there's, there's another one, chestnut, and there's that one. I also um, pulled out some brassicas that I had in here. I had some cabbages uh, and they had just gotten completely devastated by cabbage moths. So I didn't cry about it. I just cut them down 
and I put in a couple of more of the tomato starts uh, just this morning that I had in the greenhouse. So they're late now, they're, they're gold metal tomatoes, um, and I did take a long time to put them in, so I don't know if we'll get tomatoes off of these guys, maybe I'll get some really late gold metal tomatoes. These are some Nanking cherry plants that I, um, that I potted up from my other property last year and I haven't found a new home for them yet so they're waiting to find a new home <laughs> and there's a beach plum plant that came from the same place this is my messy area with all my pots and things um this is my little perennial nursery over here every time I pull up uh something from elsewhere in the yard and I need to pot it up to share with somebody this is where I tend to put it these these guys on the bottom here don't look really good. They're kind of recovering, but they are service berry shoots that were spreading out. And I just pop those suckers off and, and put them into pots. We'll see if they recover. This on the other side is my compost system that I built from wood that I got from my brother-in-law who's a builder and he had some extra wood a few years ago from a project. So I, uh, he asked me if I wanted it. I said absolutely and I built this compost enclosure with two bays um, So that I could move the pile from one side to the other uh, This one is kind of the work in progress pile uh, and then this one is the Closer to finished compost that I'm actually using even though it's still very chunky <laughs> um, the roof has a gutter on it and it feeds over into these rain barrels which are absolutely full and I have a soaker hose here so what I need to do but I haven't actually needed to do it because we've had quite a lot of rain we had a, a dry spring early May very dry but since then we've had plenty of rain and I haven't needed to do it but I'll run that soaker hose down to a bed further down the yard and because the water is gravity fed um i have no trouble just opening up that rain barrel spigot and irrigating that bed that way it's a perfect way to use the wa rain water harvested um this is a little pot of of um sun chokes that i took out of a spot i didn't want them to be and i'm going to share those with a friend later today um this is American spikenard. So this does produce flowers and then followed by berries. It is a medicinal plant. It does die back completely. So it's herbaceous. It's not really woody. Uh, though it, it looks like it would be woody. It's about as tall as I am now. Um, but it does die back completely. It's shade loving and it is really happy in this space. The leaves are just humongous and really cool. I have not used it medicinally myself, but I know that it's possible. Um, also in this bed, I have a bleeding heart under there and I tucked a pepper under there, even though it's probably not going to produce well because this is still a fairly shady spot in the yard. And even though it does get sun for part of the day, that spikenard is really doing its thing and getting really huge. So it's kind of shading out that pepper and the tomato that I tucked in there as well. Um, this is a fennel plant that I put in there. And then behind all of that is lovage that's going to seed. Lovage is a perennial, much like celery, that's edible. Some people use it more as an herb because it's got a very strong celery flavor rather than a full-on vegetable. Um, but it's tasty and very good for you. And it's deep-rooted, so it's more nutritious than annual vegetables tend to be. Um, I have another, uh, a few other pots back there. There's a high bush cranberry in a pot um, and some sinkafoil, native sinkafoil in a pot, as well as this eastern red bud that's waiting to find home. <laughs> uh, there is a big pokeweed back there. I know, I know I have to get rid of that baby, but um, it does come up there every year. I try to dig it out, but I never actually get the deepest part of the roots and it happily comes back every year. These are not um, edible for people as far as I know, but they are, they do support 
local wildlife. So I'm not that worried about it. I never let it go to seed so that it doesn't really spread around too much, but it is something that I do want to keep on top of. <laughs> um, and then in front of it, that is a uh, sweet pepper bush. And it looks like it will be flowering for the first time this year. Sweet pepper bush uh, can be used to make to turn the the blooms they actually lather when you get them wet you can use them like soap so um they can be used made into soap there are some straggly little um these are raspberries under here you see leaves of three don't get nervous those those are um heirloom heritage raspberries uh that have spread from the bed on the other side of the fence. So uh, they're just doing their thing, but I am actually gonna cut those down because I kinda wanna start from scratch when it comes to the raspberries in this area. They hadn't been doing very well, and you can see they're really getting decimated by insects. It tells me that I need to do some soil improvement before I try to reestablish my raspberry patch. Um, and then in front here, we have this is an American ground nut and there's another bit of it coming up there so I just popped a tomato cage in so it had something to climb up. This is a perennial vine. It's in the legume family and it has edible tubers but it'll also come up with these burgundy bunches of flowers and uh, followed by little seed pods that will be about the size of lentils, the beans. So um, I'm growing those, I tucked those in. These never really thrive here, but they do come back every year. So I try and encourage them. I really want them to do well, and I'm not sure what I need to do to get them to do better in this space. If you have any hints for me, please share them because I really want groundnut to do well. I actually just love the flowers and I wanna use them I, I want to create like a more of a ornate trellis system over here so that I can get them to travel up and around. Maybe it's too shady for them. I thought that they liked part shade because they're usually found uh, near streams and creeks in moist areas. And it does tend to be pretty moist around here because I do use heavy mulch. Now I'm go I've gone through the fence gate. This is the gate into the back area of the side yard. This is the front area of the side yard. So um, we're leading out into my front yard. Uh, so, so this area is where I had the raspberries, the heritage raspberries, but they really weren't doing well. So again, I'm not gonna cry about it. I'm just gonna make changes. I cut all the raspberries down. There is some weedy, stuff that's happening all through that bed it kind of looks like sorrel to me because the the leaves are kind of that arrow shaped but I'm not exactly sure what it is I've just been pulling it and pulling it and it spreads via these underground thin roots that are almost like rubber bands when you pull up that weed they kind of snap back at you when they're they're not difficult to pull up but they're kind of uh, rubbery and stretchy and you can see more of them on the other side of the bed. They're going to seed. So um, I pulled out as much of that as I could and I covered the area. Oh, I, I cut down all the raspberries. I covered the area with compost. And then I tucked in a few of those tomato seedlings that I still had in from the greenhouse. And I'm going to encourage them to happen this year. And if the raspberries start coming back up through there, so be it and I'll just try and keep this spot happy and healthy uh, right from the ground up. And we also have another couple of fennel there. Um, I'm hoping that with this application of compost um, that actually got nice and hot and then it's been, I know that it's still very chunky and not completely decomposed, but it has been curing for quite a few weeks. So I think it's ready to spread. Um, and I'm hoping that it really helps to improve this area. This area is deep, full on sand. You, you, you have to understand that my yard is at the Jersey Shore. I'm in zone 7A in Ocean County, New Jersey. And you can see from this side of the yard how sandy it actually is here. It's basically like digging on a beach. So no matter how deep 
the mulch is underneath that mulch is sand the the soil is improving i have no doubt i have a few worms now where i didn't have any before and it's getting better and better every year but it's still something that i'm going to struggle with as far as being nutrient poor because the drainage is so good so it really the rain will just wash away those nutrients and leach them down into the sand so i have to continuously apply um Next to this area with the toma new tomatoes, um, we have a yasta berry, which is a cutting that I took from the other side of the yard. And the yasta berry is a cross between a gooseberry and a black currant. I love these berries. And this is only the second year that this cutting has been in the ground. And it's doing fantastic. I'm really happy with it. No berries on here this year. It did flower a little bit, but I know that by next year, this is going to give me some great berries. This back here is mountain mint. And from an earlier video, I don't know if you saw it, um, but I'll link it here. Uh, I did have some trouble by leaving the leaves in this area and it kind of smothered the middle of this mountain mint patch. Um, it is recovering nicely, but I'm going to remove this and share this patch of mountain mint with friends that are coming by today um, to get some plants from me because it's too much and it's taking up too much space. Mountain mint is native, so I can't say that it's invasive, but it is in aggressive in the garden and it does spread like most members of the mint family. So I do have it planted somewhere else in the yard. I just don't want to devote that much space to it. So out it goes and I get to share some native plants with friends. This is an anise hyssop and boy is it ever happy in this space. It's blooming beautifully. And pollinators really love it. I saw a bee on it just before, but um, I don't see any on it now. But I do love the color of the flowers. They're so pretty. And I have a few strawberries running through this area. There's another little pepper that I tucked in there. And this is the medlar. A medlar is a small tree that's in the rose family. And it has white flowers in the spring that just look like a single layer of of rose petals and then it's followed by these really interesting fruits now um these aren't going to be ready to harvest until the fall but they you will actually leave them on the plant until they are very soft what would seem to be overripe and they should be a kind of mushy so that you can basically eat them with a spoon and they will taste like spiced applesauce i'm very excited i've heard a lot about them and i'm looking forward to my first harvest of medlar this is a royal medlar and i got this plant from a seller on ebay or etsy i'm not sure which one uh, but this plant is probably uh at least four years old now um this is horseradish and horseradish is such a substantial lovely herbaceous plant it's also a dynamic accumulator think of it like comfrey when you add it to the garden it's not something you want to till around because like comfrey if you get little bits of roots and spread them around the garden boy oh boy you're gonna have horseradish everywhere and it's kind of hard to get rid of once you have it but i don't mind that because i love horseradish so i like to dig up pieces of the roots and process them into a condiment for food uh, that we eat around the holidays. I actually eat it throughout the year, um, but horseradish is a great plant to have in the garden. It's, it, except comfrey blooms for m longer time throughout the season. Horseradish really only blooms in early spring and horseradish flowers are delicate little white flowers that remind me of weddings for some reason. I just love them. This is butterfly weed and that is part of the milkweed family. It is native here in New Jersey and it is a um it is a host plant for monarch butterflies, so that is definitely welcome in the garden. Beside it in a pot, I have a red twig dogwood. Red twig dogwoods will get very big when planted in the ground. They get to be about 10 feet tall and around. Um, they are more of a shrub, even though it's in the dogwood family. Uh, it's not necessarily, you could probably prune it into uh, a tree, a small tree if you wanted to, but they don't really like to grow that way. They're much more of a multi-stemmed shrub and they layer very easily. So um, I just didn't want to devote the 
ground space to the red twig dogwood in the garden but uh i am kind of struggling to keep this plant happy in this pot it doesn't want to be in there <laughs> um there's some more raspberries coming up around it because they are spreading out these are native raspberries so these are thorny these are not the heritage raspberries but they do not seem to be being affected by whatever was bothering the heritage raspberries further down the bed so i haven't cut these down yet these are doing okay um on the other side over here we have iris and a big patch of oregano that's spreading through here. This is probably the sandiest soil in the garden. I don't put much mulch right up next to the house because I'm concerned about having wood mulch very close to the house for termite reasons. So um, I do kind of put some compost through there, but it is pure sand underneath. But the oregano doesn't care. The oregano is doing real well. And this is um, pineapple sage. Pineapple sage uh, is doing well here and comes back every year i think because of the microclimate created by the fact that this is the south wall of the house it's nice and warm if i did have pineapple sage out in the middle of the garden and it did not survive the winter it it likes to be kind of right at the edge of zone seven is where we're we, we have it surviving. I think it likes it here or warmer. If you're in a colder area than where I am in zone 7a, you might struggle keeping pineapple sage alive as a perennial. This is my asparagus patch and this is doing okay. It, it sends up some asparagus every year, um, but it did come up sporadically this year in that uh, some very thin, thin asparagus came up very early in the spring. And so I worried about it and I stopped harvesting fairly early. And then some really thick ones kind of came up that I probably should have harvested, but I didn't. I let them fern out. And um, you can see I have some weeds in that patch. I really need to maintain it and pull those weeds <laughs> a little bit. But uh, it's still sending up new spears of asparagus throughout the summer. Um, and then let's go further down. You can see that I'm still working on my great big pile of wood chips that I got from a local tree service. And I've taken, I've, I've, I've gotten rid of most of them. Well, I can't say most, probably I'm through two thirds of the wood chips. I think I've been doing a good job. <laughs> so that's what we're working on. Um, here's some more spider wart and there's an aster behind it. Here, I know it's hard to tell, but I do have a raised bed uh, made from bricks, um, retaining wall bricks, and it kind of, it's pretty long. It goes past the fire pit there. I usually put annual vegetables in this bed, and you can see the, the four stakes that I have here are there for a, a few tomatoes that I put in. There's marigold, there's some bush beans planted back there. There are actually three peppers put back there as well. Um, here, there's a lamb's quarter. I know it's edible, um, but I don't tend to eat them. Uh, there's French sorrel right there that's going to seed. I've been cutting that back. There's some perennial kale. Perennial kale, it is just growing like gangbusters, but it is also getting really, really taken by cabbage moth caterpillars that are in here. But um, that's okay. Uh, I think that it'll survive, it'll, it'll do okay, and I just need to come out and pick those puppies off of the uh, perennial kale. And you can see the tomatoes are flowering happily. Um, there's some escarole that's about to flower in here. You can see this escarole is flowering now. Uh, it's in the chicory family, and it's a delicious green in early spring. I love it fresh in salads. I love it cooked. And then when it goes to flower, when it starts to bolt, I'm just as happy because the pollinators really love the flowers. They are gorgeous color purple. They're like the color of asters, but they bloom during the summer where asters, I have to wait till fall to see that show. Um, there's some parsley in this bed, a lettuce that's going to seed, and black Simpson, black seeded Simpson lettuce. Um, and this fire pit has peppermint in it. And 
that's doing okay in there. Over on this side, in this bed, is where I usually put vining things. So the things that are in this bed this year are gugoots, squash, and they're flowering. And it's wonderful to have these here. I also have um, Malabar spinach that has reseeded. You can see that with the red stems. And I put that underneath this new obelisk shaped trellis because that is a vining green. And those those leaves are nice and fleshy and they have kind of that mucosal kind of sap that's much like what happens when you have chia seeds or okra um but they're a really delicious green when you cook them you can have these greens raw um, or you can cook them, saute them, and they really do taste like spinach, but they thrive in the heat of summer, whereas spinach tends to bolt when it gets hot outside. Um, so there's a little pot with peppers in it there. I have Egyptian walking onions in this pot. Uh, these are perennial bunching onions that create these top sets of bulbits that tend to get heavier throughout the season and then they fall over and they touch the soil and plant themselves and hence they walk through the garden. So um, I have bunnies that come through and they tend to really like the bunching onions. So I do keep a few in pots throughout the garden just so that I can can continue my supply of Egyptian walking onions. Even though they're supposed to be perennial, they are perennial bunny food, so uh, I need to protect some of them. Um, behind the, the Egyptian walking onions, I have some black-eyed Susans that haven't bloomed yet, but will shortly. And then these are Jerusalem artichokes. And these are the red-skinned Jerusalem artichokes. I've found that these sunchokes tend to be about seven feet tall, six or seven feet tall, rather than the uh, white-skinned variety that I have on the other side of the yard, which can easily top out at 10, 11 feet tall. So um, these are just a shorter variety. And we have some asters here. These are really tall ones. I have, I did cut them uh, probably a foot below the height that they are now last month and they've come up again. This helps to keep the plant a little bit bushier and so it doesn't get so leggy. You can see that the sunchokes really tried to spread throughout this area and I uncovered this aromatic aster uh, and that fennel that was being devoured by the sunchokes earlier in the season. But over here is my other stand of mountain mint, and that is about to bloom. I won't be able to walk through this area once the mountain mint blooms because it will be covered with wasps. So I leave them to their wonderful flowers, and I just avoid this area myself when the mountain mint actually blooms. But you can see that the sunchokes actually spread right through this. They are just loving coming through this, these wood chips. There's also another uh, bit of spiderwort here because it's in full sun. It's much happier and blooming like crazy. So it's nice to have that splash of color amidst all this green. There's a fig back here that I did wrap and it recovered nicely, but it recovered very late. And this fig is uh, five years old now and still no fruit. So I'm definitely going to replace this. Uh, in fact, I intend to dig this one up, put it in a large pot and keep it in the greenhouse uh, this year. This is the last chance for this fig. I'm going to put it in the greenhouse and see how it does in there exposed to the sun and I'll keep it happy as I can in a large pot in the greenhouse. Uh, out here I intend to plant one that's more cold hardy like a brown turkey. Um, hopefully I'll be able to get a crop of figs on that earlier than I have been able to get anything to happen with this fig as far as fruit goes. Um, this is astragalus. Astragalus is a perennial legume in, in the legume family. It blooms with yellow flowers and it is a nitrogen fixer. So it improves the soil around it. Um, and then in front of that, we have a goji berry 
This goji berry is established now. Last year was its first full year in the ground. It stayed very low, um, but this year it's kind of leaping. So that's really great. I expect this, even though it stayed very low last year, it did flower, there were some goji berries on it. So I do expect this to flower this year and to produce berries for me. Goji berries are also called wolf berries. They are in the same family as tomatoes and peppers, uh, but it is perennial and the fruit is very high in antioxidants called a superfood. Um, and then this trellis, this arbor next to the goji berry has two grapes. Um, this one is doing better <laughs> than this one. This one isn't doing badly. It just didn't get as far as much of a head start as the one next to it. Uh, these I got as a red, white, and blue in a red, white, and blue grape co collection. These are the red and white grapes. I don't remember which one is which. Um, and the red, white, and blue seedless grape collection I got either on eBay or Etsy. Um, this is a dappled willow that's in this little pot. I'm really just keeping this going. If I put it in the ground, this dappled willow could really get humongous. It could re get really big. Again, I don't want to devote the space to a really huge willow uh, that's not going to produce any fruit for me. However, it's really valuable to have willows on your property because they produce a natural rooting hormone. So when I take cuttings from uh, plants that I'd like to root and share, I tend to put them in water and I add a few sprigs of willow to that water and it helps to produce some roots for me so I can get them going. So that's why I like to keep a willow going even if it's not going to be this 20 foot tall plant. <laughs> uh, we have some daylilies in the front of this, um, of this planting and then over on the other side here, I have this pomegranate that I also covered in the winter. Now, a much larger bit of this was present just a few weeks ago and it had leaves all over. It was doing really well. And then all of a sudden, a big section of that pomegranate just died back. And I don't know if it had to do with voles going underneath and eating out from under it or what, but I just cut that part of the plant out and the rest of it looks do like it's doing pretty well but it never recovers in time to flower or fruit so what I intend to do is this fall I'll dig that up I'll put that in another large pot and that'll go in the greenhouse over the winter as well and then I'll put something else in this spot because this is a really sunny spot um, but those same those same weeds from the other side by the uh where the raspberries weren't doing well are taking over this as well. And they really spread aggressively. So I need to be on top of it and clean this section out. Over here, we have hibiscus. This is a native hibiscus. And this plant just becomes humongous. It really becomes overwhelming, loves this area, loves the mulch, loves the full sun, and spreads like crazy. So this is something that I tend to manage. I cut back what I don't want because right underneath it is a rhubarb. And this, the rhubarb leaves are just humongous. That's really happy there too. It's just too close to the hibiscus. So I might actually move that a little bit further away in the fall to give the hibiscus a little more room because the flowers, once they bloom, they really are so impressive. They're so pretty. Um, there's some irises behind it. And there's a big pot that I've just tucked three eggplant into. Um, because that's what I had to go there. <laughs> and uh, it's full sun and I'm keeping that nice and irrigated. So I don't usually garden in containers. Uh, I usually have a very specific reason why I put something in a container because I wanna contain it um, and I don't want it to spread all around. But for this, I just had the pot filled with soil there and that's where those ended up because I had seedlings at the time. And this is cana lilies. This is a red leafed cana lily. Cana lilies spread via the tubers, which are actually edible and they will 
get to be about as tall as I am, probably 5'7", <laughs> and uh, they have beautiful red flowers that hummingbirds really love in the later summer month, in, in, in late summer. Next to that, there's prickly pear cactus. This is New Jersey's only native cactus, and these yellow flowers bloom for one day only. Uh, these are edible. I've tried to eat them recently and process them, and it was a disaster because I got little needles all over me, even though I followed what was recommended to me and tried to burn them off in order to process them. It didn't work out. <laughs> and. Uh, and it was too hard for me to do and I and I did get needles in my hands so I disposed of my prickly pear and it gets to stay here and you can see there's a little it looks like a sweat bee in there is rolling around in that flower and having a great time um, there's oregano underneath it some more prickly pear and some more Virginia spiderwort. Now the spiderwort, and I didn't mention it before in this video, is completely edible. There's also mugwort um, coming up all around it, which is kind of my nemesis. I know that mugwort is a medicinal herb and it can be used um, in antiviral teas, things like that. I know that this is possible, but this is just a plant that I do not enjoy in my yard, so I tend to yank it out um, when I see it. But it is growing among this spiderwort, which is edible, and um, the flowers, the buds, the stems, the leaves, the roots, all of it edible, and spreads ferociously throughout the garden. Um, once you get a clump going and it's really happy, it will spread out and you can divide it and share it and eat it. <laughs> um, so this is the side yard of myNJGarden.com. Thank you so much for joining me for this part of the garden tour for 2021 this summer. Let me know if you have any questions or comments about the plants that I've talked about. I know I feel like I went through very quickly, but I think this video is probably a half hour long by now. Uh, so um, I hope that you'll subscribe to the channel and stay with me for future updates. Thanks so much for watching. Bye everyone, have a great day. Happy gardening.